Hello, my name's Tara and I'm a daughter of Guy M. Smith, the writer. Today would have been his 83rd birthday and to celebrate his legacy, I thought we could read a chapter from his autobiography, Pipe Dreams. So I've chosen the chapter on horror novels. Here's the book. I had been attempting to sell a novel for several years. As with most writers, including some household names, I accumulated dozens of rejection slips, or rather, I binned them. My mother had a saying to the effect that, what Guy wants, Guy gets. This wasn't intended as a reprimand for a spoiled child, rather that I never gave up. In most cases, I've found that this terrier-like attitude pays off. Once again, it did. It was in 1973 and we were still living in Tamworth. In between working at the Birmingham Treasury, selling boys' papers and writing numerous articles and short stories, I was going all out to get a novel published. As I found out, it was a question of submitting the right material at the right time. In the days of genre publishing, publishers had their category lists, thrillers, westerns, horror, etc. Occasionally a gap appeared and they were seeking a title to fill it. I badly wanted to write westerns. Every publishing house had a series, often books written for more than one of them by the same authors under pseudonyms. I soon found that there was no vacancy for a new name. The Piccadilly Cowboys, as they were called, were a small group of writers who literally met the UK demand. I knew several of them, Lawrence James, Angus Wells and Terry Harknett, or George C. Gilman, to name but three. However, it was the late Lawrence James who was instrumental in getting me published. A former New English Library editor and an excellent writer, he knew the market from A to Z. One day, he informed me that Eniel was seeking a werewolf novel for their horror list. Give it a go, he urged me. Send them a synopsis. So, on a pouring wet Sunday afternoon, I set to work. I had just moved on to page two with my robust old Imperial 66 typewriter when a deafening explosion shook the house as loud as the report from a 12 bore shotgun. Jean, clutching our 12 month old baby daughter, five year old Rowan at her heels and myself rushed out through the sliding glass door onto the patio we stood there for a few minutes in the rain, but all remained quiet. I was certain that this explosion was in some way connected with the gas fire, so I switched it off. The following day, an engineer confirmed that this was indeed the source of the trouble. The previous owners of the property had not had a stainless steel liner fitted in the chimney when the appliance was installed, and consequently a pocket of gas had gathered and then ignited. No harm was done on this occasion, thankfully. I took the incident as an omen, good or bad, for my synopsis. I completed it later that afternoon and mailed it to Eniel on the following day. A week later, I received a response. It had been accepted and a contract was in preparation together with an advance. They had not even requested specimen chapters. In September 1974, Werewolf by Moonlight was published with a cover price of 30 pence. It did not exactly take the publishing industry by storm, but it ticked over, as was hoped. Rarely were category books bestsellers in the truer sense. Publishers relied upon a steady stream of these novels, which were classed as pulp fiction. Anyway, my first good book, my first book was good enough for me to be invited to London to lunch with the editor, Dot Horton. She suggested that I wrote a second book, not a werewolf story, but something of my own choice. The Sucking Pit. When I was very small, my grandfather used to take me for walks in Hopwas Wood most Sunday afternoons. During the war, an enemy bomb aimed at the railway line about a mile away was way off, tar off target. It exploded on the edge of the wood, leaving a sizable crater which filled up with water and then became covered with algae. It fascinated me, but concerned that I might one day venture there on my own, 
my grandfather told me that it was a bottomless pit and anyone who fell in there would never be seen again. Unknowingly, he had given me the plot for my second book, The Sucking Pit, which I wrote for NEL three decades later. The Sucking Pit generated some very good sales and was reprinted several times. Now, another 30 years on, it has been issued as a limited edition in hardcover, an A to Z edition in a slipcase and 400 numbered copies by Mansion House Books. They're planning to follow this up with Werewolf by Moonlight. The Slime Beast. My third novel was The Slime Beast, set on the wash, an area well known to me from my wild fowling days. Like The Sucking Pit, it was destined to go on and on. Following its publication by NEL in 1975 and reprints with a new cover, I then sold it to Grafton in 1989. After a spell in hibernation, it is due to be issued by Centipede Press USA in a hardcover limited edition run sometime in 2014 or 2015. Now came the best seller of my career, one which I shall have to go a long way to better or even equal. Night of the Crabs. 1976 was the hottest summer on record. So it was for myself when my fourth NEL horror novel, Night of the Crabs, was published. Following on from The Slime Beast, NEL offered me a two-book deal, one of which was The Return of the Werewolf, the other, Night of the Crabs. I asked them which one they wanted me to write first. Oh, Werewolf. Dot Horton was emphatic. Obviously, the title of the second book had not then reached the ears of the managing director, Bob Tanner. Bob had a phobic loathing of crabs, just like some folks have of spiders and snakes. So when eventually proofs arrived on his desk, he made a decision to launch the Night of the Crabs book as a lead title. Needless to say, I knew nothing about all of this. Authors are always the last to be informed of any publishing decisions. We had booked a family holiday in Barmouth, the setting of the novel and one of our favourite resorts. On our first evening, we went for a stroll around the town. Most of the shops remain open until around 9pm during the summer season and WH Smith was no exception. Gavin, our eldest son, wandered in through the open door and you could have heard his shout down by the harbour. Dad, they've got your books in here, hundreds of them. The manager could not help but hear. And the outcome was that I found myself on a book signing session for the remainder of the evening. Crabs were everywhere. News agents, gift shops, displays, revolving racks. In all, it went to many reprints, but the cover remained the same. It could not have been bettered. Good covers sell books, and that one certainly sold mine. Needless to say, NEL demanded a sequel, so I wrote Killer Crabs, set on the millionaire resort of Hayman Island on Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Crab's Moon wasn't exactly a sequel, rather a catalogue of events further up the coast at the same time as Night of the Crabs. Many readers wrote and asked how these crustaceans came about, as big as crows, etc. So I answered them with the origin of the crabs. By this time, I was becoming somewhat bored with my monsters from the depths, so I decided to kill them off in Crabs on the Rampage. This upset a number of fans, and just like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was forced to resurrect Sherlock Holmes after the famous detective fell over the Reichenbach Falls, so I had to bring back the Crabs. The demand for another Crabs book followed. A young editor at NEL came up with an idea which I found rather far-fetched, but I went along with it. Crabs, the Human Sacrifice is the rarest title in the series, principally because it had a small print run. NEL were about to be acquired by Hodder and Stoughton, and this tile was a bridge for the takeover, in other words, to ensure that I remained as one of their authors. Island Claws One day, I was browsing a USA movie magazine, Children of the Night, when I read that Milton Sabotsky of Amicus Films had acquired the movie right to Guy and Smith's Night of the Crabs. I was on the phone to NEL right away. 
haven't you been told? was the somewhat unconvincing excuse. I'll have to chase up your money. I received the cheque within a week, a major factor in our move from Tamworth to a remote country property in Shropshire. More about this later. As for the film, not a word reached me. I knew only too well that many purchased movie rights never see the screen. Oh well, at least I'd been paid. A year or two later, I was attending a horror festival in Oldham and shared a breakfast table with a movie buff. Your film was on the box the other week, he informed me casually. It transpired that Milton Sobotsky had died and a video company had acquired the rights to the crabs. With no small amount of difficulty, I managed to track down a copy of the video in Canada, copied for me by a film agency and then transferred to VHS when it arrived in the UK. It was a low budget production and a mix of most of my crabs novels. That exclusive Heyman Hotel became a beach hut. You heard the crabs clicking away, hidden in the shadows, but only ever saw one, King Crab. I have had approaches from movie companies over the years, but the stumbling block has always been the crustaceans themselves. Models would have cost an arm and a leg each, but today with computer imaging, the investment would be minimal. I have to interject here that Actually, Dad got it wrong about eyelid claws. Um, we found out recently that the Night of the Crabs um, was turned into a Doctor, Hill, Doctor Who film script, which was never made. But that's another story to be continued. <laughs> Back to Dad. One day, I'm sure Night of the Crabs will be filmed. But, as a director told me recently, it has to be done as a blockbuster if it is to stand any chance of success. And again, we're talking of mega money. Hamlin paperbacks. I refer to my time with Danielle as my golden era. It was great. After Dot Horton left, Nick Webb arrived, in my estimation, one of the greats in mass market editing. A giant of a man in every way, an imposing figure with his huge beard. He knew only too well what books he could sell, and I was high in his league of authors. Sadly, he passed away in 2012. I used to go down to London every so often for a lunch with Nick. We rarely discussed titles, rather contracts for the future. He had sufficient confidence to leave plots and characters to me. What would you like this time? He would ask. A three book contract would be fine, I would reply. Let's make it a four book contract and I'll order another bottle of wine, he'd say. Thus, on several occasions, I travelled back home on the train with a four book contract agreed, but neither publisher nor author had any idea at that stage about the books themselves. The time came though, when even Aniel could not handle the volume of work I was turning out. So Nick came up with a suggestion which would be unthinkable by publishers today. Find yourself another mass market publisher and we'll work with them in terms of publication, publication dates. It would, of course, have been disastrous for two GNS titles to appear in the same month. Enter Peter Lavery of new imprint Hamlin Paperbacks, an editor in the Nick Webb mould. I arranged a meeting with Peter and he came up with an idea. Flesh-eating locusts. I thought it rather far-fetched, but he promised me a lead title and a 100,000 print run. He was out to rival the crabs with another revolting species. It worked. Locusts was a sellout, followed by reprints with a new cover. The next book, Peter left to me. Death Bell was a follow-up, success, and so was Entombed. Peter Lavery and Nick Webb were a team to be reckoned with, in opposition, but collaborating. In fact, Hamlin purchased the rights to one or two of my NEL backlist titles and did exceedingly well with them. I'm credited with having created my own genre. The trade termed it nasties, but nothing lasts forever. In my third year with Hamlin, I was invited to their Halloween horror party. I think that they, like a number of other publishing houses, thought that the more horror they produced, the greater their sales would be. Horror will sell and sell. At that party were a number of unknown writers, some unpublished, but with a commission from Hamlin. 
I experienced a sense of unease. The market would be saturated. I was right. Sales began to dip. In my case, not seriously, but down from 100,000 to 80,000 per title. Imagine sales of 80,000 today. At my next meeting with Peter, his suggestion was make the books bigger and more complicated. Okay, if that was what he wanted, then I would go along with it, but I was not happy about it. Nasties had been my big sellers, short books of no more than 60,000 words. That was what my fans expected of me. They were fun books and not meant to be taken seriously. From then on, I was working less with Peter and mostly with Nancy Weber, a very experienced editor. We became firm friends, but Hamlin were going downhill and Nancy had already secured a job with Grafton. She wanted to take me with her, but she made sure that she commissioned a further two books before she left. So, with a couple of Hamlins in the bag, a month later, Nancy arranged for me to meet her new, bo her new boss, Nick Austin. I had met Nick some years previously, another highly respected editor. Nick was eager to set up a deal then and there. Two original titles and four NEL backlists. NEL were now out of the category horror publishing market, and I had secured the reversion of the rights to every book of mine which had appeared under their imprint. Nick purchased Night of the Crabs, naturally, Crabs Moon, The Sucking Pit and The Slime Beast in addition to two originals. Unfortunately, Grafton could not achieve the success which Eniel and Hamlin had enjoyed. They admitted to getting their marketing wrong, but I think that it was really the backlash from all those horror books in the early 80s. Once again, it was time for me to move on. Zebra. I had had one or two of my UK titles published in the USA, Bats Out of Hell and Killer Crabs by New American Library, NEL's parent company. Pocket Books had taken Satan Snowdrop and done well with it. Dell ran the six Crabs books, the first three with beautifully embossed covers, but the last trio had standard ones. Although the series was selling well, there was a change of editor and she did not like the crabs. Zebra, Kensington Publishing, though, were only too keen to take me on. We started with Witch Spell, which had excellent sales and reprint, followed by The Dark One, Dead End and Water Rights. In 1994, Jean and I went to New York, principally to meet the Zebra team and to talk about future books. Over lunch, I expressed a desire to write a Western. You could have heard the proverbial pin drop. They wanted another horror, I wanted a Western. A compromise was made. Write another horror and let us have a synopsis and specimen chapters for a Western. I agreed. They commissioned the Western, Pony Riders, and in 1996, published it under their pinnacle imprint, after that, everything went downhill. I was selling tolerably well in the States, but Zebra made the decision to close their horror list and concentrate on publishing romantic fiction and self-help books. Back to square one. I had been there before, so it was time to try something new yet again. I wrote a few hardbacks for Piatkus and Seven House. Some of them sold out their print runs, but the publishers chose not to reprint. I tried my hand at self-publishing with The Busker and An Unholy Way to Die, the latter under my Gavin Newman pseudonym, along with Corn Harrow, A Tale of Two Donkeys, following on my fairly successful Random House children's books. I wrote these under another pseudonym, Jonathan Guy. <laughs> Kids' books and horror don't mix. It was clear to me by this time that there was no place for genre books in the 1990s bookselling market. Publishers wanted fewer titles, principally biographies of big name personalities and blockbusters which they could hype. Supermarkets and chain stores were not only getting in on the act, but becoming a controlling force. Buy one, get one half price. It wasn't doing anybody any favours principally authors like myself, who would still sell, given the chance. My chance was to come yet again, 
and for the next few years, I was to enjoy a heavy workload with the Countryman's Weekly, and I was more than happy. So thanks to Dad, to Guy and Smith, for the decades of fun and entertainment. Hopefully, um, we'll be reprinting or republishing his, his works under Black Hill Books Limited, um, run by, by the family itself. So let's all raise a glass or whatever you've got, a cup of tea, to my dad, to Guy Ann Smith, for his 83rd birthday. Happy heavenly birthday, Dad. And bye and thanks from me.